This is PwC's vision for analytics and AI transformation, an end-to-end -end solution that can empower your business to extract more value from your data. Whether you're in the business of developing cutting-edge products or trying to help provide customers with next-level service or fishing, we can team with you, helping you harness your own sea of data and fueling your bottom line. Well, hello everyone. I want to welcome you to session 5.3. Uh, this session is going to be a panel session as put together by Professor Stuart Madnick, who among many other things is the chief of cybersecurity here at MIT. He's assembled a panel of uh, three panelists, Fred Cohn, uh, Aureli Berdugnet, excuse me, did I say that right? Berdugnet. <laughs> and uh, Lucia Malika. Uh, uh, Fred and Aurelia are from uh, Snyder Electric and uh, Lucia from Proofpoint. And they're going to talk about this sometimes complex relationship between the chief data officer and the chief information security officer role. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Stu. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a couple slides to pull up. But before I do that, let me ask uh, a couple questions. First, a statement, actually. The fact that you made it here means you've passed the important MIT IQ test, because finding this room and finding this classroom is, is clearly one of the major challenges. <laughs> that, uh, that's, a lot. that's assuming that things are in some logical order, which is not always the case. The second question, I have a question for, for those of you here, though. How many of you know if your organization has experienced a cyber attack in the last year? See, maybe about a third of the hands go up. Now, it turns out I asked that question in a very specific way. I asked, how many of you know if your organization has experienced a cyber attack? According to various studies we have done and others have done, the average cyber attack has been going on for over 200 days before it's discovered. So the fact that you don't know that you've had a cyber attack doesn't mean you're not having a cyber attack. You'll find out, I guess, when you get home to your offices and so on. So those are some of the issues we want to talk about in this session here. And the title I kind of, is kind of provocative, and those who've been in some of the earlier sessions today know, a lot of attention is going to the idea of the role of the CDO in increasing the value of data, or to monetize the value in various fashions. And so my obvious question is, to what extent should the CDO also be involved with protecting the data. And you probably have all seen, these are all different definitions of what a CDO is. It talks about the utilization of information as an asset, or to maximize the value in increasing the amount of data in an organization. So I have a question to think about, is how big a deal is this whole issue of security of your data? Now, one of the reports I, I read listed as follows, the cost of cyber attacks is estimated to be around $7 trillion. That's trillion with a T. Now, I'm not sure I agree with that number or not. And of course, that number is not just limited to how much may be stolen or how much ransom you may have paid to get your data back. It also includes the amount of disruption to your business, the amount of changes to your system. So there's a lot of consequences to a cyber attack. But definitely, the, the financial impact on the world is quite significant. Now, when I meet various groups around the world, and obviously it's, they range from people who are only loosely involved in information technology computers to those who may be you know, much more knowledgeable, one of the questions that often comes up with, this is not news, the number may be news, but there's a lot of news about cyber attacks going on. So the obvious question is, well, what are people doing about it? And of course, companies are doing things, uh, universities and research people, are doing things, so a lot of work is going on to try to address this issue. So it turns out this I call is my Harvard diagram, because you notice there are no numbers on the axes. <laughs> <laughs> but what it does say here, of course, is the good news is the good, good guys are getting better. That is, in some measure or other, we are being more effective over time in addressing these concerns. But the problem is 
the bad guys are getting badder even faster. And in fact, that gap is growing. So it's an increasing concern. In fact, according to our studies and other studies, both the amount of cyber attacks, the volume of cyber attacks, the financial impact of cyber attacks is almost doubling year on year on year. Now, getting back, as you may know, Rich Wang and I were started this activity in CDOs and data quality many, many years ago. And for a while, there was this issue of big data, the question, what is big data? And people start off by saying big data means high volume data, it may be coming at a high velocity. We said there's really five aspects. There's the issue of the variety of data, the value of data, and the veracity, the quality and truthfulness of data. I want to focus on that value one. The, the old famous joke is, why do bank robbers rob banks? And the answer is, that's where the money is, or the value is. So that's why, in many ways, as we saw in the previous session, those who are here, they, there's various articles that say that data is the new oil. It's the most valuable asset the companies have. So if that's the most valuable thing, just like the most money in the bank, it's not too surprising that people would want to steal it. Now, I'm going to kind of get a little ahead of my panel by saying, well, what, one of the questions I'm going to pose them in a minute is why should the CDOs get involved? So I'll ask them to think about their answer, but I'll give you kind of a starting point. One of the things we often talk about when we talk about companies and value of data is the notion of the crown jewels of a company. What are the most valuable things? And the question is, who really understands what data in the organization is most valuable? Who should be a person most responsible for understanding that? So that at least is one way to think about it. Now, we have a variety of members of the panel who will be introduced in a minute because I want to talk about the different aspects of thinking about cybersecurity. Because unfortunately, it, it impacts everybody in the organization, but most particularly, of course, historically, it played a key role for the CIO, the chief information officer of the company, who generally is responsible for the information infrastructure of the company. And in many companies, there is a CSO or CISO, chief security officer, or chief information security officer who's worried about the security of the network, security of the information. But then you've got the CDO, as I mentioned, who has a key focus on the data infrastructure and the data governance. So the question I'm going to be posing to our panelists is how do these three roles work together or to what extent do they not work well together? And how do we get kind of the effectiveness we need? This interesting article I saw when the issue regarding crown jewels. And once again, the guys may or may not agree with it, but there was an IBM article that estimates that between 0.5% and 2% of an organization's data is critical. I may call it the crown jewels, if you will. And that accounts for up to 70% of the company's brand or market value. Now, once again, we can talk about whether we agree with it or not, but the point being is that there are certain very specific aspects of the information that are of enormous value. And the question is, do we fully understand it and how well do we protect it? So of course, the thing we need to think about, of course, is what will be the impact to your organization? If your data is leaked, if it's lost, if it's locked up, it's all kinds of impacts. There's damage to the brand and reputation. You can incur various fines from regulators. You can be exposing confidential information that may put you at lawsuit. There may be intellectual value, intellectual property, there may be a significant value for your company, and it can erade your competitive advantage. So those are some of the kind of provocative thoughts I wanted to put forward. As I say, we've got a fantastic panel in front of us here now. I'm going to ask each one of them to introduce themselves, both tell you a little bit about who they are and what the company is, but more importantly, I've asked each one of them if they could to make one, I'll say, provocative statement or kind of initial reaction to kind of get your thoughts going for you to think about questions to ask us later. So you want to start off? You want to give the first one? Sure. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me here. So Lucia Milica, I am the Global Resident Chief Information Security Officer for Perfpoint. Um, I've been in this space for a long, long time. I'll just cap it at 20 years. It's been over. Um, and prior to Perfpoint, I serve as a Chief Information Security Officer and Chief Privacy Officer. My background is mixed from having to run governance, risk, and compliance, to product security, to corporate security, intellectual property, uh, data privacy, to just name a few. And do you have anything you want to say provocatively? Oof. You don't um, have to. We can hold it off. I think I will say my provocative statement is 
um, around the roles and responsibility of data governance. Yeah. Is this mixed model of ownership of data governance um, effective? And I will add to your, your three, the CIO, CDO, and, and CISO, I'll add to that the chief privacy officer and potentially the chief risk officer. So we are now looking at at least five C-level individuals that all have a piece of that data governance pie. And then how do we divide that in, um, in terms of making sure that we have an effective governance program for the organizations we represent? Really? Hi, so my name is Ori Bergenyat. I'm the Group Chief Data Officer for Schneider Electric. Uh, I have two mandates. The first one is managing the data management practice, governance, and all of you both, plus the performance management for the company. Uh, Schneider Electric is an industrial company, so in terms of data maturity, most of the time, we are not the one really uh, ahead of the curve. We have done an extremely aggressive move uh, in terms of data uh, management in general and data governance at Schneider. Um, uh, that started four years ago um, and really separate the IT part of the data governance part uh, from all the processes that we have. And now every transformation program in Schneider has really a business transformation and, and technology part and really a data stream. And I do believe that it's an approach which is extremely complementary. Uh, to build a little bit on what uh, Lucia was saying is like, I do think that there is not a question of data governance per se, there is a question of governance in general of companies. And data governance is the pillar which is right now the most uh, uh, looked at uh, because of the impact of geopolitics around that, uh, this kind of thing. Just a data point like for you to know, there's more than 100 data regulation regarding privacy around the world. So you have one for Sri Lanka only, for example. You have a data residency for Taiwan, did you know that? <laughs> and this kind of thing. So it's, uh, it's really at the center because no digitization will, will happen uh, without data. Uh, but I do think it's how companies reinvent themselves regarding their governance. Fred? So my name's Fred Cohn. I'm the digital risk leader for our IoT digital offer practice. A colleague of, uh, of Orly, uh, I am part of a network of security leaders uh, within the, uh, the company, Schneider Electric, uh, reporting to our CISO. So uh, my responsibility is specific into the uh, digital offer area. So talking about data, you know, things that, uh, that we collect a lot of customer data. Most of it is telemetry data. Most of it's um, time series data. We do get a little bit of personal data. But in general, uh, the things that I get concerned about when we talk about data is things like source code and other elements of it. My background is product management. I got into cybersecurity like many people did by accident. Um, like, wow, this, is, this looks like a real need, a real problem. And uh, so I got into product security. And we, we, we didn't really, I don't know how many people know about Schneider Electric, but we sell a lot of manufacturing equipment into critical infrastructure. So critical infrastructure became a big deal after a small incident in Iran called Stuxnet. All of a sudden, it was, there was a, hey, there's, this is a real threat. So now, as a manufacturer of critical infrastructure, you now are part of this story. And so I got started on that. And then Schneider's, uh, like many, I, I, sorry, like pretty much every company has a digitization strategy and really taking advantage of the data that it has. And uh, as Orly can attest, the trying to get all the data together is a Herculean task, but it, it's a journey and it's part of uh, the mission of ours. So having a digital offer practice meant being part of that digitization strategy and, and securing it is almost essential. If you can't secure it, then you're commercial side of the strategy can't hold up because you, you lose trust. So it, they, all inter, they all intertwine. And so uh, thank you for including us here. This is a fascinating topic, so. Oh, I'm gonna ask a question. Oh, and my, my, oh, yeah, my I did have a provocative. Oh, good, 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 thank you. <laughs> and it goes back to your crown jewel story, which is if you can't classify it, you can't secure it. That's similar to you can't measure it, you can't manage it kind of philosophy of the world. Excellent. So I'm going to ask the starting question, which we've kind of touched on in a little bit, 
But it's very re relevant because I, at the morning, when I was meeting some people here, they asked me what my session was about. And I told them, and their first reaction was, was well, security, isn't that the CISO's job? Okay. And so my question is, why should a CDO have a role at all in security data? Isn't that the CISO's job? I don't know who wants to take the first crack at answering that question. I'll, I'll start. <laughs> oh, <please. laughs> I'm sure Fred and I will, will both come at it from uh, different angles. Um, so to me, I view and haven't wore, um, I've not wore the CDO hat, but I've wore the, the privacy officer and uh, the security officer hat. And for me, there's an overlap. When I think through data, I really think through three prongs. I think um, about the data security aspect of it. So thinking through how do I secure the data? Well, data is at the core of everything. Then you have the legal, regulatory, privacy side of the house. They sort of all overlap on top, and that's a completely different um, angle. And then the third part of it is um, analytics, business enablement, um, uh, innovation, um, effic uh, efficacy, visibility, understanding, truly understanding the data that your company holds in terms of leveraging that and, and looking at that data as a product. Um, and those are three different parts. Now, when it comes to security, and I would love to hear your, your thoughts, um, Orly, but to me, going through, there, there are a certain level of technical acumen and technical know-how, right, to die, you know, go down to the rabbit hole in terms of making sure that we adequately uh, secure the data that we, um, that we um, hold, that our companies um, have, and that goes through um, SOC operation and threat hunting. So there's, there's sort of the very deep technical um, acumen that you have, of course, on the product side, they require, uh, the privacy side, they require a level of legal understanding to really be able to do the right analysis in terms of um, should we collect the particular type of data? You know, what are the, the um, uh, requirements for breach notification, or noti um, you know, what are sensitive PII, how should I process that? Now we've seen a proposed AI act that goes to ethic development, you know, bias in source code, et cetera, that they all are the legal determinations, right? And then there's the third part of it is how do I bring my business acumen, my, all of my technical knowledge to take that data and, and use it for innovation broadly? Um, so, that's the, sort of the high level, my, my view. You want to agree or disagree or add, add to that? Yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't know if there is uh, any mature point that uh, reality, uh, reality for everybody on, on that one. I do think that the data security is everyone's business. And I do think that cyber security should be everyone's business somehow. So that means it's all about contextualization. So. Uh, in the case of Schneider Electric, we have uh, the CISO of a company uh, who uh, has a network of digital risk leaders, like people, people like uh, Fred, uh, and who are really in charge of the contextualization of what is uh, the answer of a company uh, from any cyber security topic in the context of different, um, different environment. Uh, when you talk about product, when you talk about source code, when you talk about data, the approach might be the contextualization of the approach is specific. So, I do think in terms of risk, you have different type of risk. You have like the management practice risk, which are really data driven, and it's not only a technology play. It's also a process play, uh, a governance play, an accountability play. And then you have the incident management. For me, when we have any incident management for any breach, uh, that's come, we are directly embedded in the CISO process. No need to have 20,000 incident management uh, processes for any type of risk that you are exposed to. So there's a different play on, on that one. The, 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 certi the, the data security per se, uh, so the crown jewel, we have defined in Schneider the crown jewel. We have a process of certification of every single application, uh, this is necessary. What, we're, what I do think we need to work on and where the risk is the higher, and uh, it's within the data supply chain per se, because you can secure your different environment, but when you transfer data, it's where 
how you, you make sure that you organize with data security as well. So I do think that we need to be careful that it's not only, and it's really the, the rabbit hole that most of company goes, like it's all about technology. No, it's a combination of technology, of course, because you have technology supporting this kind of thing, but processes, strategy, contextualization of a strategy, looking at the exposure that could be either legal, but also depending if you are, uh, which type of infrastructure that you manage. So you have very different, where, what is your geographical footprint? Counts a lot as well. Um, we had a, a lot of highlights regarding privacy, uh, th thanks to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, and residency thanks to China etc. But at the end of the day, it's uh, it's how you contextualization uh, contextualize sorry and uh, uh, put in the context of the data. And the data as chief data officer, we do exactly the same. It's like like the data needs to be contextualized. You have an overall strategy for the data. Uh, and but where it's meaningful is like when you are able to deploy the data strategy across the different organization and contextualize it. So for me, it's a, it is no one answer. I do think that uh, the, the CDO is in charge of the data security uh, in the execution of itself. Any, anything you want to add? Um, I agree. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 I also want to emphasize that the data is I think there's is organized and managed uh, uh, centrally, but the application owners own their aspect of the data as well. And it's very easy to say, well, the CISO will protect me. Yeah. And it, it's just not possible. It's the, uh, it was mentioned earlier this morning about culture. We've done some research through CAMS on culture. If the management from above doesn't appreciate the importance of cybersecurity as everybody's business. Um, it's, it's just a Herculean task for any individual group to be able to properly protect all the assets from that the bad are getting bad, getting better, <laughs> faster. It's just, it's, it's overwhelming. So everybody has a part to play and the application owners really own their space uh, the data is transversal in some areas. In some areas, it's owned within the application. But our success has been not that we haven't been attacked. If you haven't been attacked, it's because you don't know. <laughs> so the, the fact we have been attacked in, in certain areas, uh, and the, the success comes from um, practicing and drilling and understanding how to deal with it, not how to protect the walls. Security, there's a very basic premise of security, which is defense in depth. You can protect the walls as much as you want. They get past the wall, you better be protecting at the next layer and the next layer. And what's in the center of that, of these multiple layers, is the crown jewels. So obviously they get and need the most protection, but some of the other information further out maybe is a little less sensitive, doesn't warrant the same cost, but it's the application owner that knows that distinction and knows the value and can express the business value and the security people enable, they help, they educate, they know the technology, they know the, the principles of what to do. But if, if, you, if you look at one owning the problem and the other just being a, a customer, if you like, it, it can't work. It's, it requires uh, um, the owner and the, and the technology expert to be able to come together with a prioritized way, deal with the defense in depth, the strategy, the challenges, and, and work together to solve the problem. So, so, can, so can I ask something really quick? Because I'm going to respectfully agree and disagree with you both. And of course, because I come from a totally um, different angle, um, I completely agree in, uh, around data ownership because um, I've built all of my models the same way. The, the data owner, of course, is the expert on, on their own data. And it's our job to educate, to drive a culture of security, et cetera. However, um, what I'm going to disagree is just broadly on the CDO role, right? Um, majority of CDOs are not, they have the C is not quite into 
um, the sea level in, in terms of being able to truly drive a culture of data. Um, and it really depends into how organizations view the data. Right, if you're an organization, which the majority of them view data as a byproduct of doing business, they don't put the right value on it, they don't necessarily grasp the concept of crown jewels. In that situation, it's gonna be very difficult for a CDO to make much progress. And we've seen, although this role has been around for almost 20 years, it's starting to get momentum in the last several years, but there's still so many examples of failures, right? Because there was the lack of leadership at the top. Right? And then there's the second group of organizations that truly do view data as the crown jewels. They look at the value of data. And, and you've talked about um, you know, the new oil, uh, which 100% agree, right? The reason we see that increase in you know, data breaches is because there's a lot of value in the data that we collect and how we view it, it's a big piece. But without the right leadership support, um, it is going to be very difficult for anybody, whether you're a CISO, CDO, whatever C-level that has to do with data you, you know, you're in, without that support, it's going to be next to impossible to drive that culture of security. I think it's absolutely critical. And you know, I do agree, you know, data governance, whether it's the CDO or the CISO, it has to be a set of policies, procedure, driving a culture, putting that you know, technical acumen into business terms, business enablement to drive business valuation, shareholder value, um, et cetera. But you know, that is our job, regardless of what side of the fence you are, to be able to translate that, that technical acumen into to value to the business for, for driving a culture of security. Excellent. Actually, that's a great point because I want to do a scientific study right here on the spot. Uh, scientific data. First question, how many people here are either CDOs or part of a CDO organization in their company? You see, there's a handful of people. So my question is going to be of those, how many of you play an active role regarding security of data in your company? Pretty much almost all of you. That's good to know. Okay. Because the question I'm going to pose to the panel, which is similar to the things you've already discussed, but you discuss things in some, at a philosophical level almost. The question is, where do you draw the line? What role should or does a CDO play in securing the data in an organization? How would you just try to define, if you're trying to think of the job description or the items, what should the CDO be doing? Who wants to take a crack at that one? I think a CDO would probably have uh, something good to say here. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll start if it would. Yeah, I, uh, to come back on, uh, on the previous point a little bit, I do think the change of culture is for sure driven by which industry you are playing to. Uh, in the case of Schneider Electric, uh, we are a 30 billion uh, dollars uh, top line company. So in terms of business models, we are playing in very different environments. And where you are perfectly correct is like depending on which type of business you are driving, you might have an appetite uh, and a sensitivity around uh, the importance of data management and the importance of data security, which might be different. Um, that being said, at, at the end of the day, it's, it's a no-brainer. So, I mean, there's, there are a lot of, I mean, in our business, uh, our businesses, uh, if we, it's a corporate play. So, that means that if we don't exist, if we don't have a proper aggressive strategy in data governance, in data security, etc., we just don't exist. That's, uh, that's the, the, the way how it, it works. Uh, when you manage a critical infrastructure, it is what it is. And, and you have certain, um, certain commitment that you take in front of your uh, regulators, of course, but in front of your customer. Right? And they trust you due to that. So we are, uh, I do think building a full trust strategy for any uh, company, that's why I was saying like there is a data governance play, but actually it's a go company governance approach. I think it's important. Then in terms of change of culture and awareness, more or less is like how you bring the awareness of like how you bring data quality, how you can reuse the data, how you, we, we have a, a full strategy regarding data security across the data supply chain is what I mentioned, from the creation to the consumption, how do we make sure that we ensure that it goes for conjugal but not only. And I do think that the, the cultural change and, and the responsibilities goes with mechanism. So you have to monitor. You have to monitor your breach uh, closely, your potential breach. You need to make testing. You, need, you have to monitor your uh, data governance play. You, need, you have to monitor your data security play. Um, you have to, yeah, the monitoring, to bring mechanism at the, uh, at the center 
of uh, the operating model of the company. Either one of you want to add, add or? Uh, I just want to uh, just really cut to complement um, what was what was being discussed. We, we really have a um, uh, as cybersecurity matures, if you like, mm -hmm. it's a relatively new field. It feels very parallel. I have enough gray hair to, to talk <laughs> about historically when cybersecurity wasn't even part of a large corporation because um, there was no, no need for it. The, the issue at the time was quality. Mm -hmm. And quality was originally done by the quality organization. And everyone else just went fast. And it was quality that trapped the problems that going out the door, hopefully. Uh, and we learned that that's just not the way to do it. And so quality went through this evolution of <coughs> quality is everyone's job. It has to be embedded into whatever. We're, and of course, this was product related, not so much uh, HR or finance. But then if you're making an HR software, then it does become part of it. So you have to build quality in. Quality has to be part of your mantra. You have to train everybody on what does it mean. You have to train them on how to behave and, and, and to uh, be prepared to say, this isn't right. Well, cybersecurity is starting, it's feeling like it's going through that same curve where it started out as, oh, it was a security guys, that's their problem, or they'll, they'll fix it. Or, and then now we're, because I'm closer to the product side than I am to the HR finance side. On the product side, it's, we have to design security in. It's not, we design quality in, we also have to design security in. We sell product to um, critical infrastructure, as I mentioned before. They're expecting a quality product, but they're also expecting a product that won't be uh, attacked. And so if you have a product that has a quality issue and you have a recall, you have a, a PR issue. If you have a product that has a security attack, I would argue you have a much bigger yeah. PR issue. And so, um, uh, so data, where does data fit into that? Data is part of the whole supply chain of making a product because a products used to be uh, plastics, maybe some metal, some circuits, components, a box. Now they all have a processor, they all have firmware, they all have or software. They everything is attackable, and so if you're if you're not managing the supply chain of, of that product, your product now has a, a security risk, which could turn into um, a threat like a, like a recall, but much worse. And for me, I, it would resonate with what Orly said. If you don't have control of the data, you, you, don't, you don't exist. It's not just that you'll have a problem. <coughs> if, you, if you lose the trust of your customer on the product side, you can digitize everything you want, but if you aren't able to convince your customer that you're trustworthy as a supplier and provide them what they need that they can feel comfortable, that that's your raison, raison d'être. Raison d'être. <laughs> raison d'être. Exactly. <laughs> My per, you, 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 it's almost, um, uh, it, it is the, the, the reason for being in the company. So it's, it, to me, it's just so important to, to have that control of that data and know, um, in, in my context, well, sir, <laughs> my context is really protecting that data for that purpose. So I think my point of view, of course, is going to be slightly different. Um, and, and I will start out by just looking broadly at the definition of roles and responsibility for the CDO. There is no standard across the board. And while I respect that Schneider seems like they, they have it, they figure it out and they got it down, the most, of, most of the organizations do not. So because we have this you know, sort of homegrown, what should the CDO role be, um, that is definitely extremely inconsistent around the industry. So it goes back to the maturity of the industry, where they are on that, that journey. Um, and then from my perspective as a security officer, um, you know, looking at you know, where my role ends in, in the past, whether I was both the CISO and privacy officer, anything that had to do with internal data quality data innovation and analytics, it was not my area. 
And so to me, that's a natural way to go, at least from a, if you're early on trying to define, do I need a CDO and what should that CDO focus on? To me, that will be the beginning of it in terms of focusing on data quality. We all have major data quality issues. Like if you're gonna tell me you don't, <laughs> I'm not going to believe that. Um, so starting out with data quality, because back to some of the earlier points, right? Like just for me from a security perspective, I can't secure what I don't see. I need data visibility in order to be able to secure it, mature it, protect it, right, you know, layer the right uh, level of defenses and controls um, to protect my organization. The same thing happens when you talk about data quality and business enablement and innovation without you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? So I will start the role of CDO at the data quality, analytics, and innovation as the, the three pillar to build upon. Right, um, I do am still a strong believer that data governance is as part of the, the CISO world, just because of understanding policies, procedures, operationalizing that in terms of protecting, um, uh, securing the assets of the organization and defining, of course, and that's a, always a partnership. It's not just a CISO on an island, right? It's CISO working with the, the legal team, with the HR team, et cetera, in terms of acceptable use for assets. Employee, you know, what do you monitor, right? We've seen, was the World Economic Forum had the latest stats that shows 95% of incidents were as a result of the human error, right? Well, once we start thinking through, how do I protect the people of my organizations, right? The people are the conduit to data. And as I think through, how do I protect those people without any viol GDPR violations? Because you know, we all have to worry about it and that not be considered employee monitoring. But at the same token, as a security leader, it's my job to secure and protect the data. Well, then I, we need to think through, okay, what are the right controls? So that, that partnership with the various different stakeholder like your, your legal officer, your HR officers are critical in, in defining that overall you know, governance model. And of course, in more mature organizations where you do have a CDO um, in that organization or a CRO, all of them that needs to be sort of the, you know, sort of accountable, responsible, um, you know, informed, sort of having that breakdown of your RACI that works for your particular organization. I will say um, just this last qu uh, quick thing and move on. When, as, as building my overall data governance model in my previous role and having dual hats, um, part of making sure there was no conflict of interest was establishing a security and privacy review board across the organization and making sure that part of that review board, every single executive member from, you know, represented from every function had a seat at that review board and they had a designated um, VP within that organization that was going to be the sort of the tracking of what was needed for that particular organization because I can't tell finance how to use the data, but we, I can. It was my job to inform of the security or privacy risk associated with how they use that data, but they are the owner of it. So, you know, sort of consulting through, but building that really not only drove a culture of both security and privacy, but also accountability back and building that, that RACI model to figure out, okay, well, this is where my, my role ends, yours begins. Um, and that was, I will say, a multi-year debate to get to a, to a, you know, sort of a nirvana for our organization at the time. Um, that, that is a continuous journey, right, that has to evolve and morph with the needs of the business. Well, you made an important point, I think, which is that, as many of us probably realize, the CDO function is relatively new. It goes back to around 2003, but clearly that was just the embryonic stages of it. So I'm going to do another experiment, if you don't mind. I need some help maybe for John with this. There were four or five or six of you who raised your hands and said you are within the CDO organization, your company, and most of you raised your hands and I said, do you play a role in cybersecurity? I'd like two of you to just tell me what role do you play? The microphone, please, John. Yeah, right there. So, so I remember this. Some people over here raised your hand. They're a bit shy now, maybe. Uh -oh. Hi. <laughs> um, and, and what's the question, Stuart? The question was, are you a CDO, and do you play a role in cybersecurity in your organization? If so, what, what role do you play? Yes, sir. I'm a CDO. Um, I'm working closely with our CISO and our security chief. We separate physical and virtual. I'm, I'm still trying. Separation? Uh, physical security. Um, th there's an argument as to whether they should be combined, 
but we've been having that argument since I joined the firm and <laughs> we haven't finished that discussion. Um, you know, I, and I, as I listen, I've got 50 questions I want to ask about <laughs> zero trust and identity and insider threats and things like that. Um, but, but my role is really to, I see the CDO as a broker. I need to find out the business requirements and explain them to engineering and to CISO and to security and make sure I can't protect anything myself. Uh, but I need to broker that data, make sure the right people get the right information at the right time. I have questions about ontologies or how do you know where the, the crown jewels are. We're struggling with that with catalogs and things like that and, you know, diagrams. So there's a lot here. I think we're just scratching the surface, but uh, does that help? Maybe one more volunteer just to see their perspective. Who else is another? Right there. Everybody's pointing to him. <laughs> Hi. Uh, yeah, so... Um, we're responsible for AIML products that um, that we build. So, um, from an engineering perspective, we're kind of executors, and we um, we build in all of the. Uh, we're accountable for ensuring that the products we build are secure. So, we get guidance from the CISO organization, uh, but but we uh, but we're responsible for actually executing. Okay, good. You Let's build go. product. So you build product? Okay. That's actually very good because that's that a good segue into my next topic I want to mention. First, I want to get a show of hands again. For how many of you does the word log4j mean anything? <laughs> oh, it's good to see because I should tell you, ask your Aunt Sally and probably you won't raise her hand. So, so it's not something that the average person in the street knows. So uh, Fred kind of alluded to this, and that's when we talk about data, to what extent do we think of software as a kind of data, because it's ones and zeros, and all ones and zeros look about the same. So the question number one is, what role does a CDO have regarding the data of the software of the company? And in particular, as many of you may know, there has been movements, I say movements means like regulations and so on, to develop software bills of materials. As you may know, the issue with Log4j, which was a piece of software that had vulnerabilities in it, the trouble is many companies didn't know if they had that software, because that software was bundled into other systems, bundled into other systems that you then acquired. And so you didn't know that three layers down in the software was this thing percolating, if you will. So the question is being posed for companies to kind of get their act together regarding software bill of materials. And the obvious question is, whose role is that? Is that something that fills in the CDO's category, or is it someone else's responsibility? What do you guys think about that? I'll take a shot and then you can correct me. <laughs> Go ahead. So, um, <laughs> you, you and from what I've seen, the, the R&D side is, let's say, managed separately and autonomously from the, the, the general HR, finance, uh, customer interacting data. Historically, that was always how it's been because they were, R&D was kind of an island unto itself. And those islands don't really exist anymore. So they're, they're still separate. The tooling is different. The uh, types of things that we protect are different. The access is different. Um, the, the evolution of developing product in-house with code written in-house and managed in-house through its life cycle and I, what's, what's the average life cycle of your product? <laughs> Three years? Sure. I, uh, I, I, we have products that have to, have to be available for 50 years. These are manufactured oh. products, yeah. Manufactured products. So. It's a challenge, but it, it, that's kind of, in, in some places, that's kind of the world we live in. So it's been a, it, generically, it's been handled separately. So I would say it's in, it, the future is not those islands anymore. It can't be the skills of protecting data are going to become merging, but uh, the answer to, I think, the previous question, uh, he, he, had, he had a whole list of questions he wanted to 
it's a journey, and the CDO role, I think, is new. I think people are developing it as they go. They're adapting it to their environment. If you're starting from a clean slate, I have one employee, now I'm going to hire a CDO, the role can be pretty cleanly defined. When you have 140,000 across employee. employees, you have a lot of inertia, and a, uh, a new role requires some acclimation and reassignment and, uh, and, and evolution, and it takes time to find that sweet spot. So I, it's, it's a journey, and I think the, uh, the general nature of, of R&D world today is pretty separate, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a matter of over time it will end up being treated like data, where today it's treated differently. I, that's my, my experience. You want to take it? And I will finish. Yeah, no, um, absolutely. Um, so, um, sorry, I'm, I, like, I, was, I lost my train of thought here. <laughs> Can you repeat that a question? The question had to do with yeah. software and the materials. Yes, SBOM, okay. What role does CDO play so in I was it? trying to think through your, your questions, because as I had owned both product security and corporate yeah. security, and there were completely different processes. As I was thinking through... Um, I bridged those, and they started out completely different. Exactly. They didn't even know each other, and... It's been in 10 years, we've seen them coming closer and closer. Yeah. So yeah. that's why I say it's a journey. Yeah, that was a journey. So I 100% agree with you. And I was going back to working back to memory lane. So it was, was very similar in my experience. Those product security was on an island, corporate security on a different island. And we had different tools. Um, on the corporate side, um, there was really a, a partnership between procurement and my internal security team in terms of. Um, doing your due diligence on third-party vendors and um, and contract size, supply chain, et cetera, and, and going through that and periodically doing pen testing against some of those various technologies, but doing the security deep dive um, you know, prior to acquisition of those, um, those various different products. On the product side was a completely different process because you had to go through secure source coding, um, you know, sec DevOps, and actually building SEC DevOps when there was no SEC in the DevOps yep. part of the process, uh, but also go went back to a source code's repository. I'm not going to say what company, but there was one particular company that they had um, over 20 different source code repositories. Well, that is impossible to secure and know exactly which one's secure, which was not. How was the code checked in versus checked out? What sort of you know third party or uh, open source code was used into that process? So that was an evolutionary process going from multiple to one single source of truth of secure um, or of, of source code repository. But then from there, uh, making sure how you do um, source code fingerprinting, um, as well as making sure that if a source code was checked out, when it's checked back in, it does not alter the integrity of that source code. Um, so that in itself was its own separate process. There was really a lot of that. And even down to uh, tech, uh, security vulnerabilities in products, we call them defects on the product side. We call them vulnerabilities on the IT side, right? Because it's going back to the mentality of the engineers being one of the engineers um, and really being able to build that, that culture over time. And I agree, over many, many years, we're able to, once we're able to bring that into one and centralize it, that is when we're able to make the biggest amount of progress and impact um, in partnership with the leadership team. But outside of that, it was very much pointing the finger in every direction, except um, you know, really honing in into to, to consolidating everything. Let me ask one more question on the panel before I open it up to the audience. There's a slightly different set of issues here. As some of you may know, government has a habit of getting involved in things, usually things they know nothing about. It's usually the most common thing to get involved in. And because of all the various cyber incidents, the various things are going on, the one I want to call to your attention is, as I understand, I've not read all the literature, the SEC is proposing, I don't think it's been approved yet, proposing a new regulation that companies report material cyber incidents, I think within 72 hours or so. Yeah, right. Now, the reason I say that, I'm very careful how I phrase that, and this is what my paraphrasing what I thought I read, yeah. it is not necessarily a, cyber, a successful cyber attack. And the analogy I use 
if two airplanes cross each other within a certain distance, that's called a near miss. And the airline pilots are supposed to report that near miss so they can learn kind of what went wrong to avoid real crashes. So the idea is, what is a material cyber incident? And the question is, should a CEO, a CDO, play a role in determining what is a material cyber incident? I don't know whether some yeah, of you guys just play a about. definition word. Go ahead. A data breach. Yep. But that, but that that's data crazy. breach. It could be somebody got your data. Yeah. Data breach could also be your data was exposed, but nobody saw it. Or it so, could be someone almost got your data, but didn't quite go all the way. Or you left a door open and nobody walked by it and nobody looked in, but you had an exposure. That is, I think, by definition, a data breach. So now back to your, to your, your the question is, is that material? If, well, if you don't know, because you don't know if somebody saw it. Yeah, maybe there's, maybe there's logs of an exfil, or maybe there's not in that, in that system it didn't have an exfil, but it was exposed. So is that material if nobody saw it? I, these are I, your government trying to help you uh, question. Spend a lot of time in good? court, guys. <laughs> you want to make a stab at it? Well, yeah, no. So I will, uh, I'll add to that, actually. It depends on what geo and what industry you're located, right? Yep. Because the definition of a breach is different under GDPR versus under HIPAA yep. versus FTC versus SEC. Even now recently, are you in banking? I think, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, there was a new... Um, a requirement for 36 hours notification <laughs> for banks from SEC that was recent. 72, like in six, in six hours. India, India six, six hours, six exactly. Hours. <laughs> and I know for those of us that to deal but with... That's GDPR, only after you've determined it's material, which could take three months. Then material is... Uh, <laughs> Not so clear. The data yeah. Not so clear. The material, exactly. Materiality is based on the size of a data set at the end of the day. The reason I'm saying this, because if you haven't dealt with this issue, it is coming to your doorstep soon. Yep. And whether you whether you directly are involved in it or someone else in your company is involved in it, but the government is getting involved, and you're going to hear that knocking on your door. Comment. Yeah, I was just going to point out there, there are more than 2,000 federal financial regulators. Yeah. Repeat your point, please. There, there are more than 2,000 federal financial regulators and jurisdictions around the world, and and each one is going to have their own definition, and trying to get normalization is what's. Exactly. And I, it's, that's where we need to get to. It's going to take a long time. I think. For those who think life is boring, that's not the problem. It's, life is going to get more and more exciting. And so you have financial, but you know, my world, it's, at least on my side of, of the security posture, it's, it's critical infrastructure. So it's product going to critical infrastructure, or we are operating something for, for a client. So it's a, it, that's a, I, I believe those are a different set of regulators. So, it, so just to add... Yeah, because we focus very much on privacy. Uh, to come back on your question of software, at the end of the day, software data are data. And uh, at the end of the day, you can, uh, uh, we need to organize uh, the convergence of any company toward the same processes of dealing with data. There's no specificity, so that's why I was mentioning that contextualization could be different, but uh, the processes per se is different. You were asking a question regarding, okay, how you do like intelligence or this kind of thing, like cataloging, etc. The starting point, you need to structure your data supply chain from creation to consumption to multiple consumption points, how you organize the convergence uh, of your different stakeholders toward the same type of rules and framework. And that's, you can deal with finance data, HR data, software data. This is the same mechanism. Uh, then what we try to do is like, um, to define crown jewel, as you mentioned, you need to know where are your system of record. That's, uh, that's a, a first step. And then you need to have a company converging to the system of record. If you are in a full spread approach, no way you can make a anything happening. And you can be in software, R&D, finance, HR, whatever. It's always the same context. And then for, regarding the regulator, finally, when you look at it, you have I mean, it's an explosion of regulation across the world uh, and with like uh, a kind of competition on who will structure. I mean, <coughs> when you look at the situation between uh, uh, Europe and the US uh, for Google Analytics, for example, it's uh, it's interesting dyna dynamic. And But at the end of the day, they all come back to a little bit the same notion of pillar. It's not only a question of privacy, because that is very for B2C. In our case, where we are much more B2B, uh, residence is very much in, in, important. 
and uh, protection in, in general, retention, etc. So that, that, that goes with full play. Regarding the, the chief data officer role in, in that one, uh, I mean, uh, we did choose in Schneider to separate completely CISO uh, data, et cetera, on purpose. And if product we, security office. And, and product security office and physical security. And physical security. And physical security. <laughs> I do think it's a blessing uh, because if you consider that a data officer, his responsibility is doing a little bit of analytics on a questionable data quality set, uh, with a little bit of innovation, no way that you can scale anything, okay? So a data officer is there to answer to two problem statements. The first one is like, how you prevent the company to any risk associated to data, associated to data. It goes with protection, security, including the cyber interlocks and the, the management of incident, and how you organize the scalability of the data. And that goes with uh, certain processes and convergence regarding the same processes. The data quality per se is like you need to have a network of data officers specialized in the contextualization of the data that are in charge and commit on the data quality. Otherwise, if you put a, a guy or a girl in the middle of your organization, in the corporate world saying you're in charge of data quality, no way they can make it. Contextualization is, is the key thing and really managing the entire process, entire life cycle of the data, no matter is the data, is the key thing. A lot of topics, so why don't we open it up for the audience. Yeah, well, there's some questions online. I think you, you just addressed some of the top two. Oh, that was uh, talking about the uh, business metric. What really makes the case for what's their role, the CDO and the relationship with uh, the chief information security. I think you've addressed those. Uh, the third one is uh, how can we build and scale security orgs faster considering shortages in the market? <laughs> <laughs> so, you thought it was staff shortages? Yes. Not data shortages. <laughs> so I guess he's saying how, how, how are, data sh are, are personnel shortages a major hindrance? Uh, of course they are. I, I won't say there's a, a magic bullet to solving a, a hmm. knowledge gap. What we have struggled with um, and continue to struggle with is do you hire security people to apply them into your scope because we aren't the same as every other company some company is similar but or do you take people out of your scope and teach them security and ideally you bring in you you, you play a combination of that because People who don't know security, there's a journey. And I was one of them. It takes a while to really appreciate what the challenges are, where to put the priorities, how to deal with all the different aspects, because it's overwhelming, all the different sides you could do. So there, there is definitely a need for some expertise. And so you have to be very careful, cherry pick. You could use consultants for a while to get you started. Um, we, we did on the product security side, I'll speak to, we started with uh, an expert or two and consultants. Then you, build, you use time, you take people from within who understand your context and teach them the security from the consultants. And then now you say you have a central team that's more critical mass, but the, you still have a large organization. The central team is really driving this. Then over time, you take people from those entities and bring them up to speed and then you disseminate. So it's, it's, a, it's not an immediate answer, but it's a, you start maybe with external experts or internal experts, you, you make a core team and then you disseminate it. If it sounds familiar, it's the quality story from <laughs> 40 years ago where it was, you know. But it doesn't, oh, go ahead. You have a question here. Um, so, Stuart, we've known each other for 30 years. You've forgotten, I have not. <laughs> and this is the first time, I'm all not, I don't care about data. I'm a software vendor and I look at software. I do not look at data. Mm -hmm. And this is a huge problem. And so for you to mention SBOM, which I assume <laughs> most of the people in the audience have never heard of, because inventory control of software is, that's what drew me into Y2K. Because these That's biggest, a while ago. <laughs> that's a while ago. And the lessons not learned, because you just were talking about it, my generation is leaving with their knowledge. The systems are still in place. And so normally talent acquisition is stealing from the guy across the street. 
that's not a tactic that's going to work <laughs> very well. So kudos for putting software bill of materials. You have to know what you have for software. And it, just, it just took 23 years or so. Right. And if the fact you only found 20 repositories mean you weren't looking very hard. So can I add something really quick? Because um, while, I, while I agree with, with Fred, I think that is not going to fundamentally close the gap on our skill shortage in in the cybersecurity industry. And as a chief information security officer, I have always struggled with, um, with finding resources. Um, that's why the gap is growing larger. And yes, I tried everything under the sun from getting the help desk gal or, or gentleman that wanted to have security to the engineering person to you name it and you know, mentoring and, and growing that. The fact is we still have a significant gap starting out with just diversity, gender. I've been the only female in a male-dominated world for my entire career, for 20-some <laughs> years. There are very few of us out there. So why not start with actually attracting, once half the population is female, we are doing a really poor job of bringing women into cybersecurity to begin with. Diversity, being able to actually hone in into the various different you know, the underserved and underprivileged communities and bringing cyber education to those that cannot afford it, that's another one. And last but not least, it starts early on and it starts in schools. You know, we need to do a better job, and I'm talking about myself as well, we need to do a better job of, of going to schools and showing up at, you know, like elementary school, middle school, and inspiring cybersecurity is a field, and it's an exciting field to be in. Right now, when you talk to, to to various different kids, it's like I didn't even think that I could do something like that. Let alone, it's like, wow, you're a chief security officer. That's pretty cool. It's like I just thought it'll be always a white guy. Sorry, excuse for all the white males in the room, but they look at me wearing a skirt and high heels. It's like, oh, okay, well, this is different. So I think we need to start thinking outside the box, and we need to start thinking how do we groom the next generation, our elementary and middle school children, to want to do a career in cybersecurity, to want to get into tech, so we can actually attract new talent into the industry and, and prepare for the attacks of tomorrow. Add a C to the STEM acronym somewhere. Absolutely. I don't know how to re redo it, but <laughs> you know, to, to make it part, make, give it some, give it a name, give it a, a Agreed. visibility. Absolutely. We got a question here, I think. I think I'll be the last one to ask the question, right? <laughs> we got plenty of time. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> okay. So my question was, with the hyperscalers and the cloud coming in, is the role of CISO um, shrinking? Because now we have these FedRAM certified clouds, we have high trust clouds, we have HIPAA certified clouds. What do you think about the role of CISO? Like, I'm asking particularly for the CISO because on the CDO side, asking we for still a have to care about the data. Oh, well, let, let, yeah. me, let me be more provocative, if you will. It kind of reminds me going back 40 years or so when PCs first came in. I remember the CEOs of companies, one time said, it's like grains of sand blowing in under the doors. People were buying PCs on their office supplies budget. Yep. They had no idea how many computers they had in their company. In, 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 a, in a similar way, you could say, well, with cloud computing, why do we need CIOs? Why do we need CISOs? Just buy it off the shelf. Exactly. Not, not need CIO maybe, maybe you could <laughs> argue the CIO maybe is more in threat. The CISO, I don't think the security threat is reduced because of that. That's I think that I'm not sure what you mean the point. Question. If 90, 95 percent of security problems come from the people, until you get rid of all the people, you still got a problem. The consumption yeah. question is not a storage or application question. It's like you can, I mean, so that's mean, you, the, the question is like when you consume any data from the cloud, so you can have your cloud secure, but then it's like what is the process to consume? So the, the question is still here. Well, and I will add to that another layer, which is one, just our digital systems that we rely on today are growing ever more complex. There are more and more cloud solutions, cloud providers, and it's becoming a more complex mesh. That's one. Two, you still need people within your organizations that have access to your container specifically, and they're the one managing the, the data, the environment for your own organizations. And oftentimes, those are the worst defenders in terms of using the same password across multiple different you know, platforms and then having one account compromise that allows a threat actor to 
to leverage their that and and get into your organizations and and obviously move laterally, disrupt, etc. So we're growing ever more complex, and then you still have the human element that is responsible overall for for managing. And then the third aspect is the audit and compliance part of it. Each one of those frameworks, they're not a means to an end in terms of, yeah, it's 100% secure. Nothing is ever 100% secure. We are all striving towards the best that we can to meet certain check the box exercises, but they are by no means secure at the end of the day. Excellent. So, well, I think we've. We are at the end of time. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Continue informally if you like. Yeah. Uh, we have to keep on schedule. So yeah. Hey, to, uh, so thank you all for the, for the audience, and thank you particularly for the panel. Thank you. Thank you.